Sarmazin, who is a historian of American religion with a particular interest in institutional development and social economic dynamics at work within American religious life. He's the author of Church and the State, Religion and Wealth in Industrial Era of Philadelphia. Um, he is, more recently, he co-edited with Maggie McGinnis, the Cambridge Companion to American Catholicism. He's currently working on a history of St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City, uh, which was established in 1849 by the Sisters of Charity of New York, um, and it was the third oldest and first Catholic hospital to serve New York City. Uh, the history of St. Vincent Hospital is a window into the history of Catholic health care in the United States and its tremendous contributions to society, especially in care for the poor and marginalized. Uh, since 2013, he has served as co-editor of the American Catholic Studies, uh, the oldest continuously published Catholic scholarly journal in the United States. Um, he is currently a professor at Seton Hall University. Let me welcome Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today for this summit, and I'm honored to have been invited to share some remarks with you this morning. It's wonderful to be here with you for an actual live, in-person conference after more than two years of pandemic restrictions. Uh, and it's also uh, quite nice for me as a native Philadelphian to be able to visit the western side of the state and to learn about the important work that's being done here to promote and preserve the rich Catholic history of the Commonwealth. I applaud the organizers uh, of this summit for their efforts and their vision, and I look forward to today's conversation. The health of our Catholic archives is a subject of great interest to me, both professionally and personally. Simply put, I would not be here today if it had not been for the Catholic archives that opened their doors and collections to me. As a graduate student at Notre Dame, my first taste of archival research came when I was scoping out ideas for a seminar paper. My joint interests in American Catholicism and the Gilded Age led me to delve into the life of Catherine Drexel, the founder of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, who used her personal wealth to support missionary outreach to Blacks and Native Americans and to sustain the work of her religious order. I was intrigued by this millionaire nun. She had received dispensation from the vow of poverty uh, because of the terms of the trust fund that prevented her from transferring her wealth from any other person to any other person or entity. She had to keep the money in her own name. I spent several days at the sister's mother house just outside of Philadelphia, looking through Catherine's extensive correspondence with family members and church officials to gain a sense of how she managed her affairs and conducted her philanthropy. And as wealthy as she was, she was unrelentingly frugal in keeping with the vow of poverty. Um, and you can see this in some of her own records where she would uh, tear off portions of letters that she received in order to use that same paper for her own correspondence or notes. So her papers look like pieces had been sort of chewed off of her correspondence. Um, and she also had a habit of cross-hatch writing, if you've ever seen this, where you compose a letter, then turn the page 90 degrees and write over what you had just written. It certainly leaves you cross-eyed as you try and decipher uh, her handwriting. I was particularly fortunate that her writings had been painstakingly organized down to detailed item-level descriptions as part of her cause for canonization. While a boon for a novice researcher like myself, it also set up a false impression for the archival order. <laughs> that research then led to my larger dissertation project, a study of religion and wealth in industrial era Philadelphia. I spent the better part of a year searching out materials in Philadelphia area repositories. I took advantage of the holdings of venerable institutions like the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and denominational repositories like the Philadelphia Archdiocesan Archives, the Presbyterian Historical Society, and the Quaker Collections at Haverford and Swarthmore Colleges. But I also reached out to parishes and congregations looking at material that sat in dusty filing cabinets, 
and that had been tucked away in boiler rooms and other forgotten places. I owe a debt to parish archivists, church volunteers, and others who had taken it upon themselves to serve as custodians of local congregational collections. Their assistance is a reminder that much of our history has yet to be formally cataloged or archived. Today, my research continues to be dependent on religious archives. As Kathy mentioned, I'm currently working on a history of St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City. The hospital was founded in 1849 by the Sisters of Charity of New York, a branch community of the religious congregation founded by St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Emmitsburg, Maryland. The sisters' work began in a rented three-story house equipped with 30 beds and not much more. There was no running water, no heat except for a small stove in the basement, and barely any space for the sisters, who slept on mattresses laid on the floor and who had only one small room to themselves. But from those humble beginnings, St. Vincent's grew to become the largest Catholic hospital in the United States by the 1960s. And so there you have an image of the original hospital uh, and then the compound as it was by the end of the 1960s, which was a bit of a hodgepodge of buildings that were assembled from uh, the oldest one that's standing there was from uh, 1901 and continuing up through the 1960s. I'm intrigued and amazed by this history and marvel at all that the sisters accomplished. It's a story that deserves to be told. I've spent countless days at the sisters' archives at their mother house at the College of Mount St. Vincent, looking through ledger books, annual reports, board minutes, and a wealth of other material related to the hospital and the sisters' extensive healthcare ministry. I am fortunate that various sisters over the years had the foresight and wisdom to bring records from the hospital and deposit them in the archives. Squirreling away would be a good description of what they were doing. Otherwise, a great deal of the history might have been lost, especially with the hospital's bankruptcy and sudden closure in 2010. In the rush to shut down, the archival preservation was not high on the list of priorities, and surely some materials never made it out of the hospital before the complex was sold. Other materials were scattered. When I started out the research, uh, the sister archivist kept telling me that the materials were up in Nanuet, referencing one of their other convents, and it took them a while to bring them back and make them part of the archive. Uh, there were also complicating factors with the ownership of official records, that when the hospital switched to co-sponsorship with the Archdiocese of New York and later the Diocese of Brooklyn, there was a question of who had ownership over records. But at least up and through 1980, when the sisters owned the hospital and uh, controlled its governing board, the records of St. Vincent's belonged to the Sisters of Charity because the hospital was theirs and they were St. Vincent's. My research on St. Vincent's Hospital and Catholic Healthcare in New York City has inspired the title of this talk. In the time I have, I'd like to offer some reflections on religious archives and the health of our history. The two are inseparable in my mind. Simply put, the health of our history is thoroughly dependent on the health of our archives. Historians cannot do our work without the material that has been carefully collected, curated, and cared for over the years by archives, libraries, religious communities, and others. Those of us working in Catholic history are extremely fortunate that our history has been so well documented and preserved. It's a reflection of the institutional nature of Catholicism and its organizational structures. There are clear hierarchies, procedures, and structures that govern Catholic life and with them a need to promulgate rules, issue orders, document decisions, generate reports, and chronicle achievements. Whatever we might think about bureaucracies, they're wonderful at producing a paper trail. <laughs> and I and my fellow historians are grateful for that. But archival materials are not in and of themselves a history. A history is not simply a chronicling of events, but the stories that we tell ourselves and others to make sense of the past, understand the present, and envision the, story, envision the future. Historians need archives, but archives also need historians to study 
and analyze the materials they possess, bringing to life the stories that they contain. In thinking about this talk, I was struck by some of the parallels between Catholic hospitals and Catholic archives. They may not seem closely related, but they have some common uh, commonalities. And perhaps I'm forcing a comparison, but I'd like to suggest that looking at hospitals and archives together can help us better diagnose the situation and inform our conversation. So in thinking about parallel trajectories, uh, first, at their root, hospitals and archives are both caring institutions. They both have a custodial role, whether caring for the sick who show up at their doorstep or caring for historical records that find their way into the collections. They both seek to ensure the health and well-being of those under their protection. I'm also mindful that this work was not always something that religious communities had set out to do. The Sisters of Charity had no intention of establishing a hospital when they first arrived in New York. They had been called to the diocese to staff an orphanage and conduct a school. But the devastation of cholera and other epidemic diseases spurred the Sisters to expand their ministry and open a house of refuge for the sick and the dying. Those who took on the work often had little training in the task. Of the four sisters who opened St. Vincent's, only the superior, Sister Angela Hughes, had any, form, had any previous formal experience in health care. Most of the early sisters who tended to the sick at St. Vincent's learned by doing, taking on whatever work was assigned to them. In much the same way, many religious communities had no intention of establishing an archive. They certainly preserved important documents and correspondence, but they had no intention of setting up a formal repository or setting out systematically to preserve the history of their activities. Maintaining a historical record was often an afterthought. When a researcher wrote in 1920 to the sister in charge of St. Vincent's, seeking information about the hospital's early years, she regretfully admitted that, quote, we have not been very faithful in keeping records of our work. It seems such a matter of course to our old sisters that once accomplished, it was forgotten, end quote. Her comments likely speak for countless other sisters, clergy, and religious. Likewise, uh, many of those who tended to religious archives generally took on the work as dedicated amateurs. As archivist and historian Jim O'Toole wrote in 1980, many Catholic archivists, both diocesan and religious, found themselves facing their responsibilities without even the most basic introduction to modern archival theory and practice. Many were appointed primarily on the basis of their former careers as history teachers, librarians, or writers of diocesan history. In an era before professionalization, there was no consistent organizational standards or records management policy to guide their work. Many of us have probably seen the consequences of good intentions. One scholar recounted visiting a convent to see their collections, only to find the sister archivist sharing with her the work of her predecessor who had taken a 1950s wallpaper sample book as a scrapbook, gluing letters, reports, photographs, and news clippings onto its pages. I think also of my grandmother, who loved sort of using industrial strength glue to keep all of the precious family photographs firmly affixed to the photo album. The early 20th century brought significant changes to the nation's medical sector, and here I want to highlight professionalization. For hospitals and other healthcare providers, the era's emphasis on scientific order and professional authority sparked a series of reforms to address deficiencies and improve organizational management and efficiency. Catholic institutions had little choice but to conform to the standards and expectations laid out by medical experts, scientific authorities, and others if they wish to remain credible and competitive. Although some feared that standard-setting bodies would threaten the sisters' control of their ministry and impose secular values on religious institutions, 
It was impossible to hold back the tide of change. Hospitals like St. Vincent's needed to adopt modern methods, even if it came at the cost of customary practice. Hospitals needed to be convinced of the value of these new methods. You might appreciate the challenges faced by Sister Germaine, the director of records of the records department at St. Vincent's. Writing in Hospital Progress magazine in 1922, she described their efforts to systemize patient record keeping. The process began upon admission, with patient information entered onto file cards used to track a patient's case history. Diagnostic notes, test results, and treatments performed were recorded on hospital-issued forms. Once the forms were returned to the office, the quote of the, 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 the sorry, the work of the registrar really begins, she commented. The sister or other clerk had to ensure that all of the information was complete and that the records employed standard nomenclature and diagnostic vocabulary. These procedures ensured that the records office staff could easily assemble medical histories and generate statistical data when needed. Even though Sister Germain admitted that the task could be irksome at times, she recognized how, quote, well-kept histories in accessible form benefited doctors and patients alike. And I like that quote, well-kept histories in accessible form. For the unconvinced, she added simply that the new system was to be accepted, whether they liked it or not, as one of the many, quote, duties assigned to us by obedience. I don't think that line would have the same power and resonance today as it did in 1922. In much the same way, religious archives have had to adjust to modern methods and professional standards over the past 40 or 50 years. In 1974, the US bishops issued a document on ecclesiastical archives that helped to spark interest and investment in diocesan archives. Responding to concern about the lack of care given to historical records, the bishops called for a nationwide effort to preserve and organize records of dioceses, religious orders, and institutions. They also urged every diocese to appoint a properly qualified archivist, even if only part-time. Efforts were bolstered by the formation of professional groups, including the Association of Catholic Diocesan Archivists in 1979, and the Archivists for Congregations of Women and Religious in 1990. These groups have helped dioceses and religious communities improve their archival practices, share information and professional strategies, and build connections through lectures, workshops, and conferences. They've also become important advocates for continued investment in archives and the preservation of historical records. And as with healthcare, improving archival standards has required not just training and professionalization, but also investment in facilities, equipment, and technology. The costs are not unsubstantial. At St. Vincent's, the sisters regularly struggled to find funds to keep up with the latest medical advances and to fund capital improvements. Labs needed to be upgraded. X-ray equipment needed to be replaced. Operating rooms needed to be air conditioned and you have no idea how much time the board spent discussing the state of the laundry equipment. <laughs> At times, entire buildings had to be replaced because they had simply grown too antiquated. When St. Vincent's raised its old ward building in 1980 to make room for, new, for a new pavilion, many grieved what had been the, the historic heart of the hospital. But in the words of the hospital's planning consultants, the building had also become a well-maintained anachronism. Archives suffered the same challenges. I remember with great fondness trips to the Philadelphia Archdiocesan Archives when they were still located at the seminary. <coughs> they were housed in the basement of the chapel, a cavernous space with all sorts of odd nooks and crannies. Only the veteran staff knew, when he knew where many of the materials had been tucked away. Boxes spilled out all over the place. Staff offices were nothing more than alcoves carved out of the book stacks. And, and only a couple of often cluttered tables served as the research area. 
Needless to say, there was no air conditioning or climate control or security for that matter. The place certainly had character, and I loved poking around its collections. But the conditions were embarrassingly inadequate. Thankfully, the archives have since moved to a new facility, a relocation that was prompted by plans to, to consolidate and sell off the, the seminary grounds. In 2017, a new Catholic Historical Research Center of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia opened in a repurposed elementary school. And it was fortunate that they had funds from a 1990s capital campaign, money that was earmarked for a new archival center to fund uh, the cost of the renovations to that building. Um, and since then, they have hired additional staff to help process collections, digitize materials, and assist researchers. The efforts remind us that preserving our history requires a tremendous investment. And the improvements have enabled the archdiocese to absorb the archives of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, who needed a new home because of that order's plans to sell their mother house. Um, oh, in that last slide, there's an image there of sort of the records department. It's not quite Sister Germain's time back in the 1920s, but it captures the, the work of professional record keeping there with 45 medical secretaries. The transfer of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament archives to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia speaks to another dominant trend in both the hospital and archival sector, consolidation. During the closing decades of the 20th century, Catholic healthcare in the United States faced a moment of reckoning. Rising costs, competitive pressures, and changes in healthcare policy prompted formerly independent institutions to band together and form integrated healthcare systems like Mercy Health and Catholic Healthcare West. St. Vincent's resisted the trend for as long as it could, but ultimately became part of an archdiocesan Catholic healthcare network in 1996. It was a difficult decision, one that forced the hospital to grapple with issues of authority and control, and to sacrifice some of its cherished independence in order to maintain its mission. Religious archives today are having to contend with similar pressures and realities. Smaller religious communities no longer have the personnel or resources to maintain their own archives. Likewise, religious communities nearing completion have to decide where to entrust their collections, their very history, their soul. Even dioceses themselves have had to consider carefully whether they have the resources, both in terms of money and personnel, to maintain and staff their archives. As many of you surely know, some religious communities have moved to establish their own national repositories, like the Mercy Heritage Center in Belmont, North Carolina, or the Redemptorist Archives in Philadelphia. There is much wisdom to such initiatives. They have allowed religious communities to bring together materials that had been scattered among various regions or provinces making it easier for scholars to access disparate materials and to gain a fuller sense of the history of those communities and their work. They bring together various branches of a family tree, a reunion of sorts. That can make it much easier for scholars. It offers one-stop shopping. Let me be clear. Anything that works to ensure the long-term preservation of our historical material is a good and worthy initiative. At the same time, though, there are drawbacks to such efforts. Among them, they can sever material from the local communities from which they have sprung. Moving materials to distant archives, taking them out of their natural habitat, makes it difficult for local researchers to access material, especially those who might be interested in using Catholic materials to shed light on other topics of local interest, whether politics, immigration, race relations, social activism, architecture, community life. The history of the diocese, the local church, can itself become fragmented when materials depart. I think about just how important the history of the Sisters of Charity is to the Archdiocese of New York. They were the largest teaching order in the diocese staffing more than two-thirds of the parochial schools at their peak. But their history is also important to the city of New York. They played an outsized role in social welfare 
from orphanages to child-saving activities to health care. Their imprint is everywhere. Moreover, the vast majority of their members were drawn from local neighborhoods, and they had deep ties to those communities through family and friendship. These were the sisters who helped tame the gangs of New York, in the words of one scholar. They were the sisters who knew how to broker deals with Tammany Hall, and who served as the voice for many who lacked power, resources, or visibility. Their stories are inextricably intertwined with the history of the archdiocese and the city itself. And I'm sure the story is the same here in Pittsburgh. The story of Catholicism in Western Pennsylvania tells of settlement and growth, of immigration and industrialization, of labor, of political mobilization, activism and reform, of educational advancement and socioeconomic transformation, of health and social welfare, of arts and athletics, of race and multiculturalism, of everyday struggles and joys. The Catholic story, not just in terms of the diocese, but religious orders and religious organizations, is part and parcel of the city and region's history. In many ways, Catholic resources are some of the best sources we have on local community life and how that changed over time. Since parishes and other Catholic institutions were rooted in their communities in ways that other religious entities and organizations simply were not. Catholic institutions were some of the first to plant themselves in local neighborhoods and some of the last to abandon them in the midst of socioeconomic and demographic change. We never want to lose sight of the regional values of the materials that we hold. So what can we do to ensure the health of our history? First, access. During the 1960s and 70s, one of the dominant themes among healthcare reformers and planners was the idea of improving healthcare access. While Catholic institutions had a reputation for always being open to all, they still had to work to break down barriers that kept them from serving those in need. Catholic archives need to be equally mindful of issues of access. Writing in 1980, Jim O'Toole noted that diocesan archives, quote, have had something of a reputation for not being especially hospitable to outside researchers. In the introduction to the second edition of his path-breaking book, The Madonna of 115th Street, Robert Orsi, a leading scholar of American Catholicism, commented how the sister in charge of the archives of the Archdiocese of New York seemed to make it her mission to impede access. She, quote, clearly understood it to be her job never to let anyone see the documents in her care. He commented how she required researchers to provide exact box and folder numbers for the documents they wished to access even though there were no finding aids or catalogs available. <laughs> um, and she also made scheduling a visit impossible. There never seemed to be a good time. It's Advent, call me after Christmas. It's Lent, call me after Easter. Then ordination, then something else. There was no time in the liturgical calendar set aside for archival research. On the opposite end of the spectrum, though, scholars have also shared remarkable stories of generosity. The late Ann Butler, a specialist in Western history, described the tremendous hospitality she received from dozens of religious communities as she crisscrossed the country conducting research for her book, Across God's Frontiers, Catholic Sisters in the American West, 1850-1920. Writing to 125 congregations with Western missions, she received replies from more than 90, and all but three of those invited her to come. In addition to sharing their materials, the communities and their sister archivists hosted her for meals, made guest accommodations available, and taught her how to read between the lines of seemingly innocuous documents. Butler acknowledged her tremendous debt to the women religious who, in many instances, shared their cherished materials with her uh, as a secular, a secular researcher. Um, the list of, uh, excuse me, the list of individual sisters she names in her acknowledgments run for nearly a full page. We need to ensure that our collections remain open and accessible to all, 
While recognizing that there are legitimate reasons to restrict access to certain files and collections, we need to think of our collections as a public resource. They serve not only the diocese or the religious community that maintains them, but all those who seek to understand the past. And many archives have done a great job in recent years publicizing their collections uh, through social media or partnerships with other organizations like the Catholic Research Resources Alliance. Not all archives can offer a robust uh, web presence or investment in digitization, but we all benefit from such online visibility. And so here are just a couple examples. Um, you might be familiar with some of these, but the American Catholic Historical Association has recently been promoting uh, a hidden Catholic collections initiative, uh, putting materials on their websites and helping direct scholars to materials that have not been used. Uh, the social media presence on Facebook and Instagram for the archivists of congregations of women religious. Um, you know, certainly during Women's History Month, these materials have been um, very popular in making a comeback. Um, and then sort of the work of publications by local historical societies. So uh, gathered fragments here by the historical society in Philadelphia, the journal that I co-edit, American Catholic Studies, we always feature images on the front and back cover in order to draw attention to archival material, and the Catholic Research Resources Alliance, which has been digitizing newspapers and other materials and trying to create a Catholic portal for research. Um, you know, these are certainly important ways that we can funnel our materials um, and alert people to uh, their presence. And even the sort of the simplest things, like making sure that the name and contact information of an archive or archivist is available is a great benefit to researchers. And without that, uh, that's the essential first step. Going backwards for a second. Um, <coughs> guidance. Once researchers arrive, archives play an indispensable role, Arch I'm sorry, archivists play an indispensable role helping them navigate their collections. They, the archivists, know their holdings better than anyone else. Valuable research has resulted when archivists have said, we have this collection that nobody's looked at before. You should dive into it. That kind of advice has been great help to graduate students, but also to more seasoned scholars like me. The archivist of the Diocese of Brooklyn, for instance, knowing my interest in Catholic hospitals, hauled out folders of material related to a Project Dutch, that was the code name. It was an effort to build a new hospital in South Brooklyn in the 1960s. The hospital was never built, so it didn't show up in the diocesan directories. I never would have known to look for the materials or ask for them. They were located in the special projects section of the Chancery Office records, not under Catholic Charities or Health or Welfare. And while the story of that planned hospital did not relate directly to my work on St. Vincent's, the planning documents gave me tremendous insights into the ins and outs of hospital planning, healthcare needs assessment, and even the complex negotiations that took place between the diocese and religious communities as the diocese tried to find a religious order in the 1960s to try and take on an additional ministry. Archi uh, archivists also help scholars understand the materials and, its and their particularities. Catholic collections can be hard to decipher, especially for the uninitiated. Those unfamiliar with Catholic culture can be at a loss. I've had to explain to students what a JMJ at the top of a page means. <laughs> when I started working on St. Vincent's Hospital, Sister Connie and Sister Mary Ellen helped explain to me what kind of records contain what types of information and what terms like sister servant meant for that particular community. Back in graduate school, I was equally grateful to the archivists at the Presbyterian Historical Society and the Quaker collections at Haverford and Swarthmore Colleges, who helped me decipher how those religious communities thought and spoke. I distinctly remember poring over budgets from local Presbyterian congregations and wondering why they were spending so much money on supplies until the archivist who had once worked at Notre Dame um, and, recognized a and recognized a confused Catholic when she saw one um, <laughs> explained to me that supplies were substitute supply ministers who filled in for the pastor when 
uh, the pastor was sick or on vacation or on vacation. Good finding aids are indispensable, but they can't replace the on-the-ground knowledge of those who work with the collections on a daily basis. If navigating the archivists is a, um, if navigating the archives is a trek, then a finding aid is only a map. It doesn't compare to having a Sherpa or a guide who really knows the lay of the land, understanding the unique topography of the collection, and who can help steer a researcher in other directions when the anticipated path leads to an unexpected dead end. Uh, the archivists are also there to keep us from stumbling, saving us from errors and misinterpretation, uh, and they should always be thanked in the acknowledgments. And I think about the importance of sort of retired sisters who often volunteer in archives who were there as a ready resource. And at St. Vincent's Hospital, many of the retired sisters, after they uh, stepped back from careers in nursing or administration, they served as patient advocates, helping uh, those who arrived at the hospital navigate uh, the institution and all the complexities of medical care. So the role that sort of sisters or, or retired um, members of religious communities play in helping researchers is uh, kind of invaluable. Last point here, sort of promoting the health of our history, responding to a changing clientele. Within the hospital, sort of St. Vincent's largely had cared for a Catholic uh, community. They were always open to all, but you know, for the most part, they served fellow Catholics. In its later years, sort of St. Vincent's became a community institution, really sort of serving all of those who came to its door and came to be recognized as a community institution. And I think sort of we as, as sort of those who work in archives and research need to be aware of how the clientele is changing. As co-editor of American Catholic Studies, I get to see the fruits of archival research and the brilliant scholarship being produced, but also makes me aware of how Catholic research has changed and continues to change. What had once been the reserve of those interested in church history, focused on chronicling the achievements of the church in the United States, the field has become much more expansive and diverse, not only in terms of topics explored, but in terms of who is doing the research. More and more of the work is being conducted by those who come to the field as outsiders. Our forthcoming issue of American Catholic Studies uh, bears this out. The lead article comes from a scholar interested in social activism who happened upon the story of the school sisters of, I'm sorry, the sisters of Notre Dame de Namur in Maryland and their anti-war activities during the Vietnam era. Her article is joined by an article written by a women's historian who recalls the life of one of the most celebrated singers in the 1850s and 1860s, a Louise Goubert, a visitation sister who taught at the Orders Academy in Wheeling, West Virginia and who established one of the finest women's academic music programs uh, in the country. Neither author would have considered herself a Catholic historian, but they came to these Catholic collections and told incredibly valuable stories. We need to be advocates for the value of our collections to those outside of our traditional audience base. Scholars don't always know the depth and range of the materials that our archives possess. It's not simply that collections remain unprocessed, but because general classifications don't always capture what a collection contains. Many of our archives organize material by institutions, St. Vincent's Hospital. But much of the research that I see coming to the journal focuses on causes, movements, trends. We need to think about how we can rebrand our collections. As we celebrate Women's History Month, I think about the value of the archives at Loyola Chicago that have taken their core collection begun by Mundelein College, a school founded by the BBM sisters, to establish a women and leadership archive to preserve the record of women and women's organizations in the Chicago region. How else can we reconceptualize our collections? A labor history collection, social justice, globalization, spirituality, diversity, equity, inclusion, urban development. We need to make sure that our collections are discoverable to those exploring, uh, discoverable to those who might never put Catholic into the search bar of their web browser. 
And speaking about discoverability, we never know what we might discover. At times, our records can also contain dangerous memories and painful silences. The history of the sex abuse crisis has asked archivists and scholars to be attuned to absences and to revisit materials with new questions in mind. Today's research into Native American boarding schools uh, has compelled religious archives to look more carefully at their collections to understand how those institutions operated and what role the church and its members might have played directly or indirectly in the abuses that might have occurred. Likewise, I give credit to the Jesuits, the Sisters of Charity, the Religious of the Sacred Heart, and others who have opened up their archives and worked to trace their complicated connections with slavery. I think, too, of the important work of Dr. Shannon D. Williams, who I hear is going to be coming to speak to Duquesne um, later this summer. Uh, she is currently at the University of Dayton, who set out to tell the story of black Catholic sisters in the United States. She has spent years conducting interviews and scouring archives. Her work focuses not just on those who enter historically black sisterhoods, like the Oblate Sisters of Providence, but also, and perhaps more importantly, on those black women who entered, or sought to enter, historically white congregations, pushing back against the unspoken color line within convent walls. In conducting her research, Dr. Williams frequently, um, frequently found archival materials close to her, or communities insistent that they did not have any black vocations. But she knew the need to take a closer look. In 2016, she made an impassioned appeal at the National Assembly of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious to ask the congregations examine their histories anew and open their archives to her and other researchers. Several did just that, including the Sisters of St. Joseph of Baden, who discovered that they had turned down one black woman who later joined the Pittsburgh Sisters of Mercy and then who later left religious life. As Sister Sally Witt has written, the community, upon learning their history, subsequently reached out to that woman, Patricia Gray, offering an apology and seeking forgiveness, which Miss Gray graciously granted. In this way, archives are foundational to the work of truth and reconciliation. They help heal the wounds of racism, prejudice, and intolerance. Left untreated, left unexamined, those historical wounds can fester. As I reach the end of my talk, I want to offer some final reflections on the present moment. I've titled this slide, Critical Care, and there's an intentional double meaning. Certainly, some of our collections are in need of critical care, an archival ICU. But I want to reinforce the idea that it is critical that we, as a Catholic community, care for and care about our collections. The very health of our history depends upon it. These are challenging times. As we make plans for our collections, we will face difficult decisions about what to keep and what we might have to sacrifice. Archivists, like healthcare workers, understand the importance of triage. Dioceses and religious communities face immense pressures to find room in their archives for records and other materials from institutions or ministries that have closed. They have to decide what is of the greatest historical value and what might be sold off, donated, or at times tossed. Art and artifacts, including sacred objects, often pose a challenge because we don't always have the space, um, the space, uh, excuse me, space or the means to store them as beautiful and precious as they are. I'm especially mindful that institutional restructuring that we as a Catholic community face, especially here in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, uh, this institutional restructuring is doubly difficult for our archives. Not only are we often in a race to preserve materials from closed institutions, we have to contend with the loss of, of excuse me, we have to contend with the loss of institutional structures and support, parishes, schools, colleges, seminaries, mother houses that previously enabled us to preserve our history and patrimony.
The laws of institutional support also include the time, dedication, and labor of clergy and religious, who have long been the ones who developed and maintained our archival collections. The health of our history depends on a stable institutional infrastructure. And as we think about the health of our history, I hope we can go beyond simply preserving what we already have, the documents of bygone years, and work to preserve the history that is unfolding before us today. We need to document the present and make an effort to preserve materials that will be of use to future historians. And I've given talks over the years to local parish groups about preserving parish history. And they often sort of ask me, like, where can we find records about our parish? And I say, we only have what previous generations have sought to preserve. And so we need to be doing that work now and telling them that they need to go out and work with parish groups in order to bring those materials from the CYO or the parents group or the Respect for Life Committee, bring those into the parish archive or the Archdiocesan archive if the next generation of parish historians is going to have those materials uh, available to them. And I think back to the founding of the American Catholic Historical Society in Philadelphia. They laid out in 1884 as their foundational mission, not just to preserve the records of bygone years, but also to preserve the collections uh, that are being generated uh, in the present day. Our archives need to be in a position to absorb new materials and encourage ongoing historical preservation. We need to work in a special way to ensure that we capture material that is born digital. So much material now lurks on servers and hard drives that we risk, that we risk losing that material if no systematic effort is made to preserve it. I remind him, excuse me. Yes, and then the last thing, sort of telling our story, and I think this is sort of critical and part of what we do as historians, to be able to bring the archival material to light, but it also helps institutions and communities. At St. Vincent's Hospital, I marvel at uh, how often in the history of the hospital they reference their own history, bringing out those stories as a way of educating members of the hospital community, from doctors and nurses to the maintenance staff, what the St. Vincent's story was. So in that way, the, sort of the archives help preserve um, and help us tell the story in an ongoing fashion. And you know that's important to us as a faith community as well. These stories are incredibly powerful and we can't live, we can't be a religious community without them. The health of our history is critical to our health as a church, as a people, as a community of faith. So in conclusion, we need to be honest about who we are. We need to celebrate our accomplishments and admit our failures, what we have done and what we have failed to do. We need stories that inspire and one that demand that we do better. Archives help us tell a rich and meaningful history. They provide lessons from the past. They remind us who we are. I and my fellow historians owe a tremendous debt to all those who work to maintain our collections, as well as those who have the foresight to think boldly about how best to care for the treasures that we possess. And I leave you with this quote from historian Carol Coburn, Although she was speaking specifically about the archives of women's religious communities, her words are just as applicable to all religious archives. And she writes, Catholic archives must ensure that our story is preserved, accessible, and communicated globally in a world searching for meaning and survival in the 21st century. Thank you.